With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. One thing optometry has been missing is a unified message that explains the importance of eye care. Now, OYE Broadcasting has solved that dilemma. We're excited to announce this content delivery service that is designed to expand and enhance your practice and grow the industry of optometry as a whole. Please visit OYEbroadcasting.com for more information and sign up today. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gell, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at OpenYourEyes2020.com, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Ocular emergencies account for 3% of all emergency department visits. True ocular emergencies, if ignored, can cause permanent blindness. Quick, proper diagnosis and treatment, depending on cause, can many times lead to a full vision recovery. Today's guest, Miami optometrist, Dr. Allison Baozong. Dr. Baozong lectures throughout the United States on ocular emergencies and urgencies. Allison, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Very glad to be part of your podcast. So, Allison, let's get into it. So, what is the difference between ocular emergencies and ocular urgencies? Yeah, so that's a, a great first question uh, to kind of kick everything off. I think that we have to think about it from, you know, first of all, the, the patient's perspective, when it's really hard to differentiate one versus the other. I've seen a lot of times where, you know, the patient didn't come in because they didn't think it was something emergent. They thought maybe it would get better over time, you know, such as flashes and floaters that ended up getting worse. Um, and then I've seen the opposite where people just aren't sure what's happening and they come in, you know, to the emergency room for, for dry eyes. And we all know that's not necessarily an emergency, but from the, you know, provider's perspective, we should uh, be able to kind of categorize these. In my opinion, something that's urgent is something that has the ability to threaten vision within a short period of time, but not necessarily immediately. So this could be something like, you know, a patient who has primary open angle glaucoma, the pressure is, you know, in the 30s or 28 or something like that, but they've had it for a long time. So they come in and they have cupping, they've got all the signs of glaucoma, but I see that and I think, you know, this isn't necessarily an emergency. I don't need to, you know, hold this person here and get the pressure down right away immediately because it's probably been an ongoing chronic process. Um, something like, that, you know, that, that we definitely need to address within the next, you know, week or two weeks, I think would be something that's urgent. Something that's emergent would be something that has the vision threatening potential right now. So something that we need to take care of as soon as possible. These people aren't leaving the chair until we have a plan in place um, or kind of the next step. So for me, some of the, some of the ophthalmic emergencies, at least that come through our emergency room um, would be things like, you know, retinal detachments, especially if they're, they're fovea on or macula on, cases of infection, and um, bad you know, corneal ulcers that are severe, central, or threatening to cause severe thinning of the cornea, um, cases of retinal artery occlusion, like a CRAO or central retinal artery occlusion, things like that have the, or angle closure, glaucoma, that's another one we think of. So these things can all threaten vision within a very short amount of time and require treatment and management very aggressively in those cases. So history is also is very important when it comes to ocular emergency versus urgencies. Uh, what are some of the questions you might ask for some, as somebody maybe is calling up on the phone, they lost their vision. What's some of the history, uh, the type of questions that we would ask in the history? Yeah, very good, very good point. So I think history is something we can't underestimate the power of. Um, when we're getting a history from a patient, say, for example, they do call in and they have, you know, a new symptom of vision loss. First of all, you want to qualify the vision loss. Is it, you know, a little bit of blurring that kind of comes and goes when they blink their eyes? That might be more indicative of something like dry eye or ocular surface disease, not a true emergency. 
if it's something where, you know, I lost my half of my vision, you know, the right half of my vision went black, you know, um, something like that, or a sudden blackening of the vision or everything goes dark would be more indicative of maybe a vasculopathic thing, such as something that could be a harbinger for a stroke, actually. Um, so those ones to me are, are, it's important to kind of classify exactly how the patient would describe it. And then also if the vision returned again, so, you know, it doesn't always mean it's not, not emergency if the vision came back, because certainly we know it still can be. Um, but describing, you know, is the vision still like that? And when, when was it, you know, was it two weeks ago or was it six months ago? Did this happen an hour ago? Those kinds of things also help kind of drive, you know, my exam and uh, when I need to see the patient or where I, where I would send them next. Do you have any type of emergency kit that you have in, uh, in the Baskin Palmer emergency department? So, um, yes and no. I mean, we, we have everything. So it's not like there's one little box that we pull out. It's, it's honestly a, a huge team effort. So just to give, I guess, maybe the listeners a little bit better of an idea, we're part of the University of Miami and we are with the University of Miami Hospitals and our Baskin Palmer Emergency Department is actually open 24 seven. So we never close. Thankfully, I don't work 24 seven. I've got normal hours, but during the day, we're the busiest anyway. Um, and so we have a huge, you know, team of, you know, physicians, resident physicians, we've got nurses, we have technicians, um, everyone down to, you know, basically all levels of care is, they're all critically important. Um, and so, you know, in that kind of context, we do have, you know, everything that we could need possibly. So we've got, you know, an area for eye wash, which is one of the most important things. When we see a patient, when they come in within, you know, a few minutes of them basically telling their name at the front desk, if they need some kind of, um, you know, rinsing of the eyes or things like that on the, the first nurse that talks to them is basically our triage nurse and she gets their history and then takes a pH and we decide what we need to do at that point. So before the doctor even sees the patient, you know, our nurses are actually helping to already assess the situation and kind of stabilize things um, from an ocular standpoint. Um, other things that we have, you know, in office, definitely all of the drops to bring the pressure down. Uh, we've got, you know, things like Diamox in case we would need that um, for patients who may, may be in an acute angle closure and we have to bring the pressure down. So there's a lot of, you know, those different things that we do have. Um, and then we probably have, I would say, more than the average, the average place just because of kind of our affiliations with the hospital. So I look at true emergencies, uh, maybe chemical burns or central retinal artery occlusion, uh, and both of them could cause blindness, but both of, if treated quick enough, we could prevent blindness as eye doctors. Let's start with chemical burns. So somebody comes in with chemical burns, what's the first thing that we need to do? So the first thing that we need to do is um, get a brief, you know, brief history. What happened? When was it? Did you clean the eye or rinse the eye at all? Um, and you can, you can get a general idea of kind of what's going on from that sense from the patient. You don't want to spend too much time going in, let's get the visual acuity, let's get the eye pressure, let's do all this and that with the normal exam flow. I would rather someone come in, we know they've got a chemical injury or chemical burn, um, and do exactly what, what we do, which is basically triage the patient, ask what happened, when was it, check the pH. Those are the first things that you need to do with those patients. And we're checking um, it in the eye. I just, so just to... Make sure everybody knows it's chemical burn of the eye. We're yes, exactly. About. Yeah. So the eye doctors. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, what that entails is uh, every office, I think, across the United States should have pH strips, and that basically will allow us to check the pH. Now, a couple of things when checking that, um, I always like to remind people that, especially my my residents that work with me, if you're checking the pH in in one eye compared to the other, we do it basically by holding down the lower lid and putting a little strip of what feels like paper almost, um, kind of in that lower fornix, that lower pocket. And then within a few seconds, we have a reading of the pH. So that tells us how acidic or how basic the ocular surface is. And we can compare it to their good eye. If they have one eye that got the chemical in it and the other eye is fine. I oftentimes like compare it person to, or eye to eye on the same person. Um, if it's something that got in both eyes, and sometimes I'll actually check it against, I've checked it against myself because pH strips are, are great, um, but if you've had them for a long time, if they've been exposed to sun or UV light, they might not function exactly the same. Um, so in that case, you know, if you need a control, 
I've used myself <laughs> for it just to kind of check. Um, so once we get that information, you know, and the pH should be around seven. So if you have a pH that's nine, we know that's very basic, right? And that I needs to be lavaged and rinsed immediately. Um, in those cases too, it's helpful to, you know, rinse the eye or wash it out. A lot of places will have BSS, like sterile BSS solution, which is fine. Um, if places don't have anything, you can use sterile water, um, but there are other solutions that are out there that are amphoteric solutions, meaning that they turn from a base to an acid based on what the surrounding uh, chemical is. So those are actually cool. We don't use those. We use just kind of the, the BSS and we have a, an eye wash station that we use, um, but that's a good thing to, to keep in mind. So really that's kind of the, the first step there. And then after we rinse the eye and we neutralize the pH, which might take a few rounds and rechecking after, you know, wait about five minutes to see, you know, let some of that, that water or saline rinse out. So you're not just checking diluted, you know, saline. And then you can recheck the pH again. And then once you get it normal, then we can get our history of our vision, things like that from the patient. So, so, but People are sometimes confused, which is worse, an acid burn or a base burn? Yeah, so that's a, or an, a alkaline, great or an alkaline burn. Right, right. As, as far as the ocular surface, I probably can't speak to like skin burns necessarily, but um, for the ocular surface, you know, the, those are the two types of burns. One thing I will say is that it seems like everybody that comes in thinks that they have an acid burn. So you, you ask them what it was or some kind of acid, and then you'll, they'll have maybe a picture if they were like, I love this. When they take a picture of the bottle of whatever it was, you can go online and I look up the MSDS sheet and see what the chemical composure is. And it tells you the pH. So I'm, I've always struck by how many are like, it's an acid of some sort. And then I look it up and it's actually basic. So it has a high pH. Um, in those cases, you know, it's good to know what it was at the beginning, definitely. And I always add that into my, into my record for the patient. Uh, but generally speaking, as far as ocular surface burns, both can be bad, but bases tend to be a little bit worse or a little bit more uh, more vigorous on the eye. So when you're looking at the eye and you're examining the eye and you're looking at the conjunctiva, what are you looking at? Are you looking for it to be really red or are you looking for blanching that we're losing some of the blood vessels? And could you explain the difference? Yeah, definitely. So when we look at the ocular surface in the case of, uh, of a burn, first I like to just get an overall assessment with white light and look at the conjunctiva, just like Dr. Kelb said. So um, or sorry, I, said, I said Kelb, Kelb, I mix up your first initial and last name. That's okay. <laughs> so just like you said, though, I mean, if you look at the conjunctiva, what you would like to see more is an eye that maybe is a little bit more hyperemic. So it's got some vasculature to it. Times where, we, where I get a little bit more nervous, and this is not as common, because it's in more advanced or more severe burns. And thankfully they're less common, but you'll see blanching. So in a severe burn, you'll see areas of the conjunctiva that actually have blood vessels that are just gone. So that means that area moving forward has had you know, vascular damage. It's more likely to be ischemic as time goes on. Um, and then it's also more likely to lead to long-term deficiencies like stem cell deficiency where that that area around the cornea and scleral junction, the limbus isn't getting the, the nutrients that it needs. Mm -hmm. So definitely blanching is a scary thing. Um, if you see that, that usually indicates a worse burn. So if it's red, it's actually better than if we're seeing a white eye, then we're a lot more nervous about it. Yes, and then there's also the, the burns where you'll see like it's more white on the top and more red on the bottom. It doesn't mean the white's blanched on the top. Usually chemicals tend to kind of uh, pool in the inferior fornix. And so you'll see usually a little bit more red inferiorly, but where it's white superiorly, just make sure you can see small little blood vessels. And maybe the chemical just didn't impact that area of the eye as much. So if you can still see little blood vessels, um, that's fine too, as long as they're not totally blanched and gone. So if it's like battery acid or vinegar, and some refrigerants, that's typically more acid, but the alkaline burns is the, is the, the guy that's working the plaster, the cement layer. Uh, those are the ones that we really have to worry about. Yeah, definitely. And cleaning solutions. A lot of home household product cleaning solutions are also bases as well, which is part of the reason I think that a lot of, you know, people will go through and kind of childproof their houses once they get 
kids that are mobile because actually, um, you know, burns are more common or, or chemical injuries for the eye are more common in that 20 to 40 range, usually in males. But for a one year time frame, it's, I believe it's one to two year olds have the highest one year time frame for having an ocular chemical injury, which is scary, but that's really the age where they start moving around the house, they're opening cupboards and where do we keep our cleaning supplies? Mine are under my sink, right? So they're usually fairly accessible. And that's why, why we have to really be careful with where we're storing those things if we have you know young kids around. So if somebody's home and they get a chemical burn in their eye, what's the first thing they need to do? First thing they need to do definitely is rinse the eye out. So I'm guessing most people at home don't have that, that amphoteric solution. Mm -hmm. um, and they might not even have sterile basic saline solution, which is BSS. Um, so water, just use water. If you have distilled water, great. Um, you know, but really just lavaging the eye out and rinsing it. And they're going to want to kind of hold the lids open with the eye has a natural tendency to try to close and protect itself. But in those cases, you want to really rinse the eye out. And how long do they typically, should they rinse it for? And, and once they get to the clinic with you guys, how long do you rinse it for? Yeah, so great questions. I think a lot of it depends on the nature of the burn, how much got in the eye. If it's a tiny little drop of like a salad dressing or something, it might be an irritant, not really that dangerous. If you had a whole thing of bleach spill um, on your face, you know, that's obviously going to be a lot worse. So kind of in mind with how, how much chemical got into the eye is, is usually a good indicator. Generally speaking, I'd probably have people rinse the eye for five minutes and then give it a break for a little bit, five more minutes, maybe at home do 10 to 15 minutes of rinsing, um, and then go in and go in for an evaluation. And then at the time of presentation, it really depends on the pH and you basically will just lavage and rinse the surface until the pH is normalized, which can be a couple minutes, it might be 10 minutes, it might be 20 minutes, it really depends on, on what's there and what you're seeing. So a Bascom, you're, you're going to rinse until the pH gets to about seven and then you guys are, and then we'll talk about the treatment after that. But before you mentioned that you'll, people take a picture of what got in their eye and then you will look it up to see what the chemical makeup is. What, what is that website again? Or how do you do that? Yeah, so if I can see the name, like the product name, and then I write, I'll type in the product name and then type MSDS and then look up the, and then you can usually find a PDF somehow that's, that's there in Google, of course. And uh, one of the first few will usually be that kind of chemical. If there is one, there's not always one, but if there is, that's a really good place to start. When I was in school, they used to tell us to call poison control. Is that something <laughs> that you guys do anymore? You know, I feel like poison control uh, would probably be helpful if you can't find it. You know, after you kind of stabilize things, um, I, I feel like sometimes poison control is like, you know, at, at our fingertips a little bit, if you know what you're looking for. But if, if you can't find it, certainly I think that would be a good, a good uh, avenue. I've never called poison control before. So talk, talk, tell us how we manage it. Once we get the person stabilized, what are we looking for? And there's a lot of different ways to manage it depending on how bad the injury is. But typically, what are some of the ways that we would manage it? Certainly. So really chemical exposures to the eye can be anywhere from very mild um, and mildly irritating to extremely severe. So depending on that range, I mean, if you're more in the mild category. Sometimes if it's mild enough, you might just need preservative-free artificial tears to kind of keep the eye well lubricated while it's healing. And over the next day or two, things will kind of normalize. Um, in cases where there's, you know, epithelial erosion and, and breakdown. So I mentioned briefly earlier, I like to first look with a white light and just look at everything in general, the ocular surface. The next thing that I do is actually like put in a drop of fluorescein, which is a dye that, that will stain kind of devitalize or damage tissue on the surface of the eye. And that allows us to look for any evidence of corneal epithelial defects or conjunctival defects. In a lot of chemical injuries on the surface of the eye, you'll see conjunctival defects as well um, that you wouldn't normally be able to pick up unless you actually put fluorescein in the eye. So I like to look at that. And then based on the extent of that, um, based on the, you know, the clarity of the cornea, if it's clear versus hazy, hazy is, is going to be worse, obviously, because the cornea is supposed to be clear. Um, then you kind of step up your, your management protocol. So in a mild 
Um, a mild injury, the first thing that you have to probably get on the eye or, or keep on the eye is an antibiotic if there's any epithelial defect just to protect it from infection. I'll still always use um, non-preserved artificial tears in pretty much all of these cases. And then the other thing that a lot of people don't think about is actually the use of corticosteroids in acute injury like these because it helps to decrease the inflammation that's there. And this is a very pro-inflammatory state for the eye. So people will think, and I get this question a lot is, oh, you're going to put a corticosteroid on an eye with an epithelial defect because in our heads, we think back to, I think it was a rabbit study that showed that putting corticosteroid eye drops on a, um, an epithelial defect in the eye retarded the, the growth of the epithelium. So it was a slower healing. So we always think back to that. And that's definitely true. I think we've seen that clinically sometimes, but in these cases, you're still battling a lot of inflammation. And so even getting a steroid on there in a, you know, a mild burn, you know, four times a day might be a good thing. Once you get into the kind of the higher levels, you really need to be assessing for, um, you know, the need for more advanced therapies, such as maybe an amniotic membrane, for example, in really severe burns. And thankfully, I don't see actually a ton of these, um, but they, they do come in. Um, you would be possibly using something like, can we talk about products? Yeah, like, sure. Okay, so <laughs> Propair is the one everybody thinks about, right? The cryopreserved amniotic membrane. And that actually has a ring around it. So it has a, a symblephron ring, which basically if you're starting to see symblephron or scar tissue from the conjunctiva to the lid, for example, that's a very, you know, that's a severe, uh, severe burn at that point. Um, and usually in those cases, if you start seeing stuff like that, or if it's really severe, you could put that ring on with that amniotic membrane that helps to heal the cornea centrally and then peripherally it helps keep scar tissue from, from forming and kind of closing things off. Um, other things that we think about, you know, high dose vitamin C, you can use that. And then also doxycycline can be helpful um, in those cases as well. And those are kind of anti-inflammatory, anti-collagenase um, that can help with stromal integrity and help the healing process. Now, do you ever use any of the dry membranes, amniotic membranes? I, not so much in, in chemical injuries as much. Um, I guess it depends kind of on what people have, you know, at their, kind of at their fingertips. Um, part of the reason with the dry ones in these cases with the burn is that you've got an eye that's hot and you're putting on, you know, membrane and then you have to put a, a bandage contact lens on top of that. And I worry that that bandage lens might impact the ability of, you know, different medications to reach the surface of the eye a little bit. Um, and also the, I feel like the, the wet ones, the cryopreserve that are, that are rinsed, I feel like they tend to help a little bit better in these situations where there's so much inflammation. Thank you for that. that that's an important distinction. One thing optometry has been missing is a unified message that explains the importance of eye care. Now, OYE Broadcasting has solved that dilemma. We're excited to announce this content delivery service that is designed to expand and enhance your practice and grow the industry of optometry as a whole. Please visit OYEbroadcasting.com for more information and sign up today. Uh, let's talk about the second, what I would consider an ocular emergency per person, an older person loses their vision, they come in and they have a central retinal artery occlusion. Tell, talk to us about that. Yeah, so an unfortunate situation, definitely. Um, I feel like I, I missed a few of the emergencies when I was listing them off earlier. There's just, there's a lot, you know, right, sure. there's a non-exhaustive list, but CRO or central retinal artery occlusion is definitely one of them. Um, in those cases, typically the, the, you know, pathophysiology for, um, just for basic understanding would be that we have, you know, retinal arteries that bring blood into the eye, nutrients, oxygen, and everything. And then we've got retinal veins that bring everything back out after, you know, our eyes, the retina has taken what it wants. And then, you know, the rest of it goes back to the circulation. So in those cases, we have basically anatomically one artery that will go in and kind of feed the inner retina which is a central retinal artery and then it branches. And so what we're talking about is when those, when that central, um, that central artery trunk basically gets blocked, that means that the inner retina has basically no or very limited blood supply in those cases. So patients will complain of a couple of different things. They sometimes will have 
like we talked earlier, that acute loss where the vision just totally blacks out completely. Um, and that might be, uh, you know, a transient thing that could be for about five seconds or 10 seconds or something. And then it comes back again. Um, they can also have where the vision decreases and it doesn't necessarily go all black out, but they might, you know, go down to 2400 or something very significantly reduced from their baseline. So those are kind of the symptoms that we, we would see or hear about, I guess. And then there's no pain with these. So, you know, a lot of times people think, especially if the vision comes back, they maybe thought it wasn't a big deal. And they're like, oh, it didn't hurt. You know, my vision came back, I feel fine. Still, they need to come in and be seen. So what we see clinically would be, you know, uh, retinal whitening. So the retina itself will be kind of opaque and thicker and whitened. Um, and those cases are definitely emergencies because, you know, especially over the last, I feel like five to 10 years, people have kind of taken this issue and sort of championed it and pushed it forward to say that, you know, a CRAO is a stroke. So these patients that have a central retinal artery occlusion, you know, even though they are walking in, they're talking fine, there's no slurring of the speech, you know, their limbs are working okay, we still need to consider this a stroke. In these patients, and they absolutely need to be worked up for that, definitely. So, uh, so you would do a stroke workup, and mm -hmm. so, but first, before we do the workup, we have to get their vision back. So we have about ninety minutes to try to get their vision back. Unfortunately, if after ninety minutes, pretty much, if you don't get it back, uh, it's probably not coming back. So, what are some of the heroic things that are done to try to get somebody's vision back? once they've had a central retinal artery occlusion, which is that painless sudden loss of vision, and typically it's in one eye? Yeah, so great question. Um, I have yet to have a patient come in in that window, um, unfortunately. So they're usually when they come in beyond it, um, theoretically, you know, and I would, I feel like this is something that I would talk about with, you know, medical students in their second year of school when they go through their ophthalmology course. Theoretically, a couple things could be done. You could do digital manipulation or massage, which is basically massaging the eye. The intention with that is to dislodge the embolus um, and hopefully get it moving further down so it's not in that central central ulnar artery. Um, other things people- I just interrupt for a quick, quick, before the other, how about with a gonioscopy lens, an indenting gonioscopy lens? Yeah, yeah, so same lens. thing. So so I guess I'm using, I think digital because I was talking to a bunch of second year medical students and they're right. not gonna do gonio. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, you know, that's another way to manipulate the globe and theoretically kind of um, cause that pressure differential to sort of dislodge the, the embolus. Another thing that people talk about is, a, is an anterior chamber paracentesis to reduce the intraocular pressure rapidly. Hopefully that will cause less um, pressure back on the arteries in the back of the eye. And then the goal then is again, to get that emboli or that blockage to move further downstream. So those are two things that it, people- Explain what a, par a paracentesis is, if you could. Yeah, so a paracentesis is ba basically um, done, you know, at the slit lamp under topical anesthetic. It's where a small uh, blade basically, or some needle is used to make a small um, opening at the edge of the cornea. And then that would cause an egress of fluid through that wound. Um, and basically that would lower the pressure inside of the eye temporarily. Not to be done by someone who's not a professional. <laughs> <laughs> and how about blowing it, blowing, breathing in a paper bag? Yeah, so so another one. I mean, I, I, I feel like, you know, these probably have, you know, bearing, and I would have to look at initial studies on them. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the thought is that by breathing in more CO2, there's vasodilation of the arteries, and then that could also dislodge the embolus as well. So breathing into, you know, like you said, a paper bag, breathing in and out would increase your CO2 intake, and that would cause, cause that change as well. And typically, what type of workup would you recommend for somebody who had a central retinal artery occlusion? Yeah, so, so in the Basically, when they come in, I mean, we've got, you know, a stroke center right next to us, basically. And so my recommendation is to, to go over there. So we actually transfer the patients over. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm a, that I'm a neurologist and know all of the stroke protocols that, that people undergo in these situations. But typically, they do have an MRI with uh, diffusion-weighted imaging. And that would tell if there's an acute stroke in the brain. They also have, I mean, a full comprehensive evaluation by, by neurology typically. 
And then they also have different studies. So they'd probably do um, an echocardiogram or look at the heart, look for any um, particular um, formation changes, such as like a PFO, a patent foramen ovale. They would check usually the carotid arteries as well and make sure there's no source of occlusion or embolus there. And then typically I'm assuming a whole host of, of blood tests and I probably wouldn't be the best person to go through everything that they do um, in the setting of an acute stroke. Um, but there's definitely set up, you know, at every emergency department should be should be set up to evaluate these patients. You know, I've heard mixed uh, things about TPA, uh, whether that would use that with central retinal artery occlusions. What's the feeling over at Baskin Palmer? Yeah, so again, I mean, it would depend on the patient's acuity of presentation. So if they showed up three days later, probably not as efficacious in those cases. And then also the mechanism by which it happens. So we've had a, a couple of patients over the last few years come into us and they've actually had filler, uh, filler associated complications. So, you know, fillers are cosmetic typically, and they can be done to, you know, improve, you know, the area bags under the eyes. They might have, um, you know, filler there in the tear trough or nasolabial fold or something. But those fillers, if they're injected into an artery that has a, an asthenosis or connection to the ophthalmic artery um, or the central retinal artery, then they can have an occlusion. So those patients, I mean, it depends on the mechanism of their occlusion, right? Those patients with filler-induced complication where they've got filler in their central retinal artery, those aren't going to respond to TPA or something like that. So that's where the exam you know, is, is critical and the history is really critical in these patients. Generally speaking, those are younger patients. They're going to be in their 20s or 30s or 40s. Um, and you can see, you know, the, the vascular changes in those patients. Um, though it depends. I mean, I, it also, you know, if the patient's within the window of time, certainly we would, you know, I think consider that more highly and probably give our recommendations to the to UMH or the hospital that we work with. Um, if they're outside of the window, then you have to think about patients who are like, okay, well, you know, oftentimes maybe we talk to the patient about it. Maybe it's worth it. We have to take into account their other, you know, comorbidities systemically as well. And then also, I guess you'd think about, you know, probably being a little bit more heroic, I guess, in the patient that has one eye, for example. So what if this is their only eye? Then we do we just try it anyway, even if it's there outside of the window and things like that. And maybe we do. So, you know, I think there's a lot to kind of unpack in that question. Um, and it's really a, you know, a patient to patient kind of decision, I think. With fillers, is there any treatment for that? I mean, you know, can that be broken up? So not, not really. So a lot of times the, in the, the picture that if you look it up, you should look it up online too. There's, there's been a lot of publications of it, um, within the last few years, I think, but the vessels are just so full of filler material so you think about most fillers are um, could be broken down by like a, a hyal hyaluronidase type of uh, like an enzyme that could um, break them down again. I'm probably saying that incorrectly, but you know you'd have to get it in the exact same spot to get in that same vessel. So if people have filler and they want it removed here, that you, that can be done in a lot of cases um, by injecting in that area too to break it down. But in the central retinal artery there's really not a good way to get that medication there. And then also we don't really know what the effect of that would be in the retinal circulation. So I think that in those cases, unfortunately, you know, at, at this point in time, to my knowledge, the vision's a loss. Well, that's frightening. I guess you don't recommend fillers. I, uh, I think in the, in the hands of the trained professional, they're a fine thing, you know, but there's so many places popping up that do fillers around the eye that, that to me is actually fairly frightening, you know, to, to have someone that might not check for extravasation. They might be in an artery when they're not supposed to be. Um, you should never be injecting in an artery in those cases, um, but checking for that and then making sure that the anatomy is well understood by the practitioner who is giving the filler is very important. I mean, not filler patients, but patients that have older patients that have central retinal artery occlusions. Typically, the lifespan of those people is only about five years, so they really need to be worked up and change their lifestyle and need to be taken care of, uh, you know, very carefully. 
I think I read, um, I can't remember, I think it was published in 2018, but it was a study that talked about central retinal artery occlusions. And of the patients that had a, a central retinal artery occlusion, when they were referred to an emergency department, 93% of them had a change made to their, their you know, medical therapy or to their lifestyle or something. So that's a huge percent of people that they found something that was off that could be, could be changed. And I think they said of the CRAO patients, 33% of them or something around that one third mark had also an acute stroke in the brain at the same time that was asymptomatic. So that's a high percentage for those patients. Yeah. I mean, those are people that have that. Those are pretty sick people mm -hmm. and they really need to be, you know, taken care of very carefully. So uh, one, one of the things that could cause uh, a central re retinal artery occlusion is giant cell. Can you talk to us a little bit about giant cell or temporal arteritis? Yes, this was one of the ones I felt bad for leaving off the list earlier. <laughs> so <laughs> this is certainly, you know, when we talk about ophthalmic emergencies, this is definitely one of them. And uh, this is one of the, the cases where it can be a little bit difficult to diagnose at the beginning if they don't present with the classic feature. So in general, giant cell arteritis is a condition where there is inflammation of the arterial walls of typically medium-sized vessels. So in the body, it can cause systemic symptoms, um, such as things like polymyalgia rheumatica. People tend to have, you know, fatigue, weakness, you know, shoulder pains, hip girdle pain. Um, they might have lower energy levels. They might have headaches is another very common complaint for these patients. But you think about these, these symptoms in the population that gets giant cell arteritis and they're the aging population. So when you ask about hip pain, you know, in someone who's in their 90s, like they're probably gonna have some level of hip pain, right? So I think it's important to ask the right questions. Now, what can happen in, in giant cell arteritis from an ophthalmic perspective is that the same size arteries that this disease typically affects primarily are the same ones that feed the choroidal circulation um, and then also it can affect the retina too. So when we see these patients, one of the ways that they can present is with a, an inflamed or kind of a swollen optic nerve heads. And we look in the optic nerve looks swollen. And then generally speaking, it looks less perfused because it has a lack of blood flow. So we think of it instead of being more red or pink in color, it's usually whiter. Um, people will call it kind of a chalky white disc edema. Um, and that's kind of the, the classic presentation that we think about with these patients. But we also have to think about patients that have, you know, headaches, especially if they've got, you know, headaches, temporal headaches, um, pain on the side of their head right here when it's, you know, um, tender to palpation. Uh, and then one of the other questions that we need to ask these patients would be jaw, about jaw claudication. And so generally speaking, we, um, we only will kind of hear the answers for the questions that we ask. And so I, I think it's important to phrase the question correctly in a way that you need to, that the answer is going to be helpful. So instead of saying, you know, does your jaw hurt when you eat food, you might say, because that could be a couple things that could be TMJ, that could be, you know, other things, dental issues. But what we really want to know is that the, the masseter muscles or the muscles that are, are muscles of mastication or chewing, those muscles are actually um, the, the same kind of blood supply that, that goes to those muscles. The blood vessels are the same size and caliber as the ones that we think about with giant cell arteritis. And so what's happening is as they're chewing, they're using a lot of the, the muscles. They're, they're getting more and more blood. They need more blood to keep that process going. And those muscles are becoming ischemic because they're not getting that blood supply. And so after they start to become ischemic, then they get claudication, which is basically pain with use of a muscle. And that's when it starts to hurt. So it's not like oh, I, I pop in a piece of gum and then after two bites, it hurts already back here. This is like with prolonged chewing, does it start to hurt? And so you think about things that would be chewy or, or require a lot of kind of work or something tougher to eat. Does that hurt after you've been chewing for a while? Then does it seem like it's getting worse? And you really, if you can try to narrow down the answer to that question, that can be helpful. And what type of vision do these people usually have? Um, I've seen anything from 2020 to light perception, and then they could also be no light perception. So it can really run the gamut. Um, the, the 2020 ones are scary because they're at risk of a, a, a misdiagnosis possibly. 
maybe they, someone would think it's something less serious, like a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which is still visually devastating, but not as bad. Um, generally speaking, most of the patients will present with vision, I think 2200 or 2400 or worse. So the blood test that we're going to do is a SED rate. If you could talk about the SED rate and the difference between a female and a male, what the number we're looking for. Yeah, definitely. So um, this is a test that I get fairly frequently because of um, patients being referred in for giant cell arteritis suspect or things like that. And we have access to the labs to get the same day. So generally speaking, in these patients, you'll want to get a couple different tests. So you'll want to get a test called a C-reactive protein. Um, and every lab is going to have a different value as far as what's abnormal on those. Um, generally speaking, you know, I think our lab's like 0.5 or something like that. Um, but I've read in the past that anything up to one is, is, can be normal still. But if you're getting a CRP that's like five or six, that's definitely elevated. If you have a patient um, you're suspecting to also want to get the SUD rate um, or the ESR, and that's going to tell us basically kind of the level of inflammation in the body. And people can have a high SUD rate without having GCA. So that should be said. Um, it's not specific for... Um, you know, to this, this disease in particular, but generally speaking, if you have a set rate, the, the rule is for, for males, you divide the set rate number by two. And then the that's you divide normal. the age, divide oh, their yeah. age. Their, yeah, their age by two. And then that's what, what their set rate could be that or lower is normal. So if someone has a set rate of 80, you would divide, um, someone's 80 years old. Sorry, <laughs> I mean, okay. so I'm 80 years old, divide that by two, 40 for a male would be would be normal. And then for females, just add five at the end. So yeah, females yeah. have a slightly higher set rate naturally than, than men do. And then the other thing that you'd want to get is um, a CBC as well with differential. And then you would check, um, check those values as well, including platelets too. And when we talk about treatment, uh, you know, we need fast treatment. We don't want this happening in the other eye. Now, have you seen vision come back in the eye that has lost vision that had giant cell arteritis? Have you seen vision come back or is that pretty much it? We just have to prevent it from happening in the other eye. So really good question. Um, I would say I, I probably haven't seen enough of these to be you know, someone I, would cons I wouldn't consider myself an expert on this, on this condition by any stretch. Um, I have not seen someone regain vision from it once in the, in the few that I have seen. Um, and those ones came in usually after, you know, weeks already had passed. Um, and so, you know, at that point, it's kind of, you already sort of know, but generally speaking, the, the vision recuperation from this condition is limited. And so you're exactly right. We're preventing it from occurring in the other eye becomes extremely important. Um, and it really, you know, can basically save their livelihood if they're still able to get around and, and see to move and um, do their activities of daily living. So I'm asking them, uh, do you prefer IV steroids or oral steroids, or you don't think it really matters? Yeah, so at Baskin Palmer, we do IV corticosteroids first, um, and we usually do a treatment for a few days. It's so like three days, possibly, of IV um, methylprednisolone. Uh, the the bioequivalent level, and I don't know what it is, but to get the same equivalence as the, the amount of IV steroid we use, you'd have to take a lot by mouth, which could have other side effects, um, you know, stomach ulcers and things like that. So that's one thing that we would consider too in the treatment. But then after the patient's been on IV steroids for a few days, then you would switch over to an oral steroid. Um, and it depends on the patient, of course, but some people will use kind of the added, like, you know, one mg per kg per day. Um, and some people will use 60 to 80 to start with a very, very slow taper. So let's turn our attention to ocular trauma. There's about two and a half million cases of eye injuries a year. 40% uh, of all new cases of monocular blindness are from eye injuries, more common in men. Uh, let's talk about hyphema. What is a high femur and what are we looking at in ocular trauma? You close globe, open globe, and then let's lead into high femur. Okay, so 
Um, with ocular trauma, you know, there's again so many mechanisms by which it can occur, and so getting a really thorough history is is super important. And I'll tell you one that actually happened. Um, was it two weeks ago or three weeks ago by now? I can't remember, but a patient had come in and was working with metal. He said he was cutting, um, like cutting metal or cutting a nail. And he said a piece of metal flew in, hit his eye. He was wearing his contact lenses. So it flew and hit his contact lens. And so he took it out, um, but he was having some pain and discomfort and blurry vision. So he came in. So what I heard was, okay, he was cutting metal. He was probably grinding metal on like a wheel and a tiny fleck probably flew off and hit his contact lens. So that's what I, I heard his story. And then I made up the pieces to fill in the blank in my head. So now I'm looking for like a tiny metallic corneal form body. But I look at the eye and I have my resident with me and I, um, I had, I looked first and then I had her look and no, no, no. She looked first actually. Cause I had her describing it to me. I'm like, okay, you tell me what to write. And I'm just going to, I'm like your scribe right now. Just write it down. Mm -hmm. And she's describing things and she's going kind of slow. And then as she goes, it gets like worse and worse and worse. And I'm like, wait, so I'm expecting a tiny metallic form body. And she's like, there appears to be a, you know, a corneal abrasion. Oh wait, corneal laceration, which is deeper, obviously, into the stroma. She's like, and the iris is abnormal, and there's a cataract. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is not what I was thinking. And so then I look, and and sure enough, the patient has a full thickness corneal wound. He's got a focal cataract. The iris has some damage to it as well. And there's a lot of inflammation in the eye. And I thought, okay, so what I heard and from the patient and then what I filled in in my mind wasn't right. So then I, I called one of our friends uh, or one of our colleagues in ophthalmology resident to come in and look. And I said, Hey, can you come look at this patient? He's got an open globe. He was Cytel positive, which means his eye was actually leaking fluid out of the cornea. Um, and so I called her in to come evaluate because that's kind of the next step in our, in our process. And I was like, okay, let's talk about what happened again. Cause I think I misunderstood. And what happened was it was actually a piece, a nail, a nail had flown up and hit him in the eye and he thought it just hit his contact lens. So I said, wait, the whole nail piece hit your lens. He's like, it hit my lens and I took it out. So what actually happened was a nail entered his eye enough to hit his lens. And then he pulled it out Ooh. himself. Yikes. So, so your history. And I, I was like, man, I, I missed that the first time <laughs> the history becomes so important in these cases. Um, and so the first thing we want to do with any case of ocular trauma is rule out an open globe, just like my patient had. Um, and really that's where there's a breakdown of the wall of the eye. It can be the sclera, the white part of the eye, somewhere in the back. It could be in the front, it could be the cornea. I really, you know, anywhere essentially can be at risk technically for, for an open globe. Um, and then when we have, you know, different parts of the eye, we have to basically keep our mind very open. Once you see one finding, that's not all they probably have. Always look for more. So knowing what you could encounter in a case of ocular trauma, um, and then sort of piece by piece, looking at every structure of the eye and ruling things out. So hyphema, for example, is something that's very common. That's basically where there's blood inside the, the anterior chamber of the eye. Um, and that can be from blunt trauma. Usually it's caused by some kind of tear in the iris tissue um, because it's very vascular and that can lead to blood leaking in the eye. And so those cases, you know, a lot of times we'll see the hyphema, there's probably going to be something else going on in that eye too, maybe some commotio retina, you know, probably a, a mix of iritis, traumatic iritis as well. So I want to backtrack just for a second before we go more into a hyphema. Uh, when somebody, when we, before when we were talking about chemical burns and you're rinsing the, you're rinsing the eye out, what happens if they're wearing contacts? Do you take the contacts out first or do you leave them in and you still, are you still irrigating? Yeah, so great question. Uh, with those cases, definitely take the contact lens out for sure. I've had, I feel like you can have it both ways where the contact lens was helpful or harmful. Um, in cases where it's helpful, I've seen where they basically had kind of like, you know, stippling punctate staining around where the lens was and you took the lens off and the cornea was almost pristine, which I was like, oh, that cornea, I think the lens absorbed some of it and then was able to protect the eye. In other cases where the, the contact lens acts like a, a sponge, like a, uh, you know, basically soaks up everything and then just sticks it against the cornea and it can make it worse too. So, but to evaluate, regardless, you have to take the lens off and I would rather rinse with the lens off so you know you're cleaning the ocular surface completely. 
Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.